right, everybody. So we have James Krieger with us today. He is the founder of Weightology.net. He has a master's in nutrition and a master's in exercise science. Uh, he's well known in the fitness community at this point. He does a lot on the papers that Brad Schoenfeld has worked on. Uh, he's been on other podcasts as well. So welcome, James. Uh, thanks for having me. And so for today, you wanted my donation to go towards the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So if you could just briefly explain why we chose that one. Yeah, Make-A-Wish Foundation, I've always really liked that charity because, um, you know, they, they, like, they give experiences to, you know, individuals and, I mean, and kids with terminal illnesses, things like that. And, you know, me having kids myself, it's just like, uh, you know, I, I hate the idea, especially a kid with a, a terminal illness, you know, it's just, uh, it's heartbreaking to me, you know. And so for me, it's something like the Make-A-Wish Foundation, you know, gives these kids at least a chance to experience something in life that, you know, that they otherwise wouldn't be able to, you know, in the short time that they're going to be here. So, um, so that's why I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that charity. I just, uh, you know, and I've seen some of the things they do and the smiles they put on these kids' faces is just awesome. So, yeah, yeah, it is great. And, um, I, I definitely agree with you on the children. So I, I work mainly with Operation Smile. Um, and then other people have done like St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Those ones, I, like you said, it kind of, kind of just rips at your heart a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you also, you're very much on the research side, um, but you also do this yourself. You're very into lifting. You've competed. Um, I've seen the pictures of you. How much did you weigh in those pictures? I'm just curious. Oh, God, I was so skinny. <laughs> I was like at my contest weight, I was down to 152 pounds, which is, you know, uh, I mean, that was the lightest I had been in years. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you're like how tall roughly? Uh, like 5'10". So I was really okay. thin, you know, yeah. like, uh. I mean, it looked good with my shirt off and stuff, right, but, right. <laughs> <laughs> but if, with on. clothes on, like my clothes were all baggy and I had the diet face and stuff. Like I just, you know, I just, I felt so emaciated. So, uh, so m most likely not going to do that again, unless I can yeah. put on another 20, 30 pounds <laughs> or something. Right, you right. Know? <laughs> yeah. It's the eternal struggle of a natural lifter. Do you want to look good with your shirt off or your shirt on? It's hard. To I, know, I know. And I, and I much prefer the shirt on, especially me, what I found with me is is I will get the diet face even before I hit single digit body fat percentage, right? Right. Which I hate. You know, it's just like, um, so that that's why I probably never do it again <laughs> because, yeah. like, I mean, I'll I'll just get that bony look in my face and and I'm not even and I won't even be close to contest shape yet. And I'm just like, screw this. <laughs> right now, I, I can totally understand. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so we had first talked a couple months ago about having you on. And uh, this was when the a lot of the controversy was coming up around that volume study, um, which I don't necessarily think was warranted. But, you know, you did see kind of a side that came out about it, you know, bringing up issues. So I did want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So um, just as kind of a recap, the study had the three different volume groups and the groups that had 30 sets per muscle group for upper body and 45 sets per muscle group for lower body saw the most hypertrophy. So. Um, one of the issues, and we can, we don't have to go through everyone, but we, you know, one of the issues that people brought up was maybe these like statistical games you were playing to show a certain result, um, which is silly. And I think you point out yourself that there are a lot of other ways one could analyze that data if they wanted to use statistical games. And if I recall, uh, you did a, um, it was like a baseline adjusted ANCOVA, right? Yeah. And, and so there are other ones, and, and I, don't, I don't have a huge statistics background. I do have a bit. But there are certainly other tests you could have done or other ways you could have analyzed the data that would show, you know, much, uh, a much bigger difference in results. So can you just kind of touch on that a little bit? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, what people understand is, is these statistical tests were, were decided on before beforehand. And in fact, they were decided on when when Brad submitted the grant for the study. He sent the grant to me. He said, OK, I'd like you to fill out the stats section that you're going to, you know, you, that you'll do the stats on. And so that's what I did. So. So this idea that they were tr we're trying to somehow game the system with our stats is like is just is so dumb, you know. I mean, yeah, if I if I wanted to try to game it, I would have used something like magnitude based inference or stuff, which has been a big controversial thing, you know, um, which is way easier to show differences with that than mm -hmm. than the statistical procedures I use. So, um, I mean, if I if I wanted to game the stats, I know how to do it. <laughs> you know, right, it's right. like, um, you know. Uh, and I even heard things like, you know, another, we also did some Bayesian type stuff, uh, really just using Bayes factors, which some people would argue isn't really true Bayesian, but 
that's like a different argument. But um, so we did some base factors and stuff. And, and so then there was, you know, people trying to, there was controversy over how we were interpreting the base factors and things like that, which were just based on very rough guidelines, number one. I mean, it's not like they're, it's not like they're, they're set in stone or anything like that. Um, and then I, I had even heard accusation that we chose the base factors because it would make it easier for us to claim a difference, which also was dumb because we had also decided on the Bayesian analysis before, <laughs> before the data was even completed. Right. And um, anyone can just look at another study we published, which was a frequency study. It was a three versus six study that was just published. That study was actually submitted for publication before the volume study, it just, but it sat in review for a much longer period of time. Yeah. And we did the same stats, the same Bayesian analysis in that one. And, and in fact, I ran the stats for that one before I ever even saw the volume data. So there was already, already a precedent for me to use in the Bayesian stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just, you know, and here's the other deal. It's like, the, the fact is our results were fairly robust to a variety of statistical analyses. Like there are other analyses I could have chosen that would have shown the same results, you know? So um, I usually have more of a problem um, if your results are very, very sensitive to the statistical analysis you use. So if you use one procedure, you know, it shows significant results. You, sh you show it, use another procedure and it, and it shows nothing even close to significant results. That's where I think you, that's where you can, that's why I think you have problems. And in fact, that, that low carb energy expenditure study that was just published by um, um, David Ludwig and stuff. So I did something for my research review for that. And uh, the data is publicly available. So I analyzed it myself. And what I found is the results vary dramatically based on which statistical procedure I use. So mm. um, that's where, you, you know, that's where you can start to, you know, if your results are... Your results should be able to speak for themselves even without the statistics in most cases, you know, I think. Um, sometimes, I can't say that's always true, but, um, you know, in this case, our results, I think, sp spoke for themselves. I mean, even if you just, just look at the graphical data, you know, even completely ignoring statistical significance and what statistical procedures were used, it, it, there was a fair, very clear pattern in every single muscle group. <laughs> And it was the exact same pattern in every single muscle group. And uh, so that's kind of my long-winded answer to that. So. Right, right. Um, when you talk about how with that other study you ran, you know, depending on how you ran it, you got kind of different results. Um, do you find that that's ever purposely, I mean, I'm, I'm sure in some cases it could be purposely manipulated because, you know, generally studies that don't find any results are less likely to get published. So um, do you find that maybe there's a reason some people might trust studies less if they know that things can be manipulated so easily when it comes to the uh, statistical portion? Yeah, I mean, I think people, for the one that was just published, I don't, you know, I don't think there was anything I would say nefarious going on with it. Um, I just think the authors were a little bit, uh, you know, this really a separate issue, but um, I don't think there was anything dishonest going on with the authors, you know, um, of that study. Um, I just don't think their results were very robust. Mm. Um, and there's a number, a number of other issues with that study that, that I won't go into. But okay. but yes, I mean, I can see how people um, might not trust data. I mean, you know, there's, there's things like called, you know, for example, p-hacking, where you'll try different statistical procedures to try to get a p-value below 0.05 and things right. like that. I mean, um, you know, uh, you know, there's the, um, there's data dredging, which is kind of, you know, where you just start going through your data uh, in any type of secondary analysis you want to do to try to find something, you know, I mean, that's something that, that Brian Wansick did with all his stuff. You know, he was the, the Cornell guy that got in a yeah. lot of trouble. Um, so he was doing a bunch of data dredging and there was a lot of other stuff going on with him. But, um, so it's totally understandable why people might not trust what's going on. I mean, uh, um, you know, that's why I just think it's, you know, it's, um, I, I think there's a big push now, um, which I think is a good thing for, for more transparency uh, in research um, for example, publicly available data sets, things like that. 
that would allow other people to double check work and, and things like that, you know, and, and, and I'm a big proponent of that. I would like to see more of that. Um, you know, we were talking about Greg Nuckels. I know Greg is a big proponent of that as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that I think, uh, definitely would like to see more of. So for sure, for sure. Um, and one thing that was brought up, which again, I don't, I don't think it had a lot of credibility was that catch up growth in the, in the last, like the highest volume group how they had a lower baseline. Um, for one, as, as I think you pointed out, the uh, the model that you use is meant to correct for that. So yes. that, that's one thing. But then two, um, didn't the strength not go up as much in the uh, the high volume group? Like that wasn't superior, right? It, it, so Yeah, that's the thing. The idea of catch-up growth um, it doesn't even make sense because it wasn't, if that was really the case, you would have seen it more consistently among all the different things that we measured and you didn't like, like there were some cases where the people that started off the lowest, like in terms of strength, didn't necessarily gain the most strength and things like that. So, um, you know, um, you know, it, it, you know, there's, yeah, it's just the idea of catch up, you know, and then, like I said, there's other studies that have looked at basically because that idea of catch up growth, um, basically means that, okay, well, basically what you're implying is that baseline muscle mass should be a predictor of how much muscle you will gain. So people with lower amounts of muscle mass should gain more in response to the same training program. And we know that's not true. That's been investigated right. in more than one study. So there's just, there's just that, that catch up growth hypothesis just doesn't make sense on a variety of levels. So. Sure. Sure. And um, the only other one I, re I remember some people bringing up was when it was measured, I think it was maybe like, I don't remember the exact time, maybe days, uh, and some people were wondering, could there have been some residual cellular swelling? Um, and I don't recall the answer to that in terms of what you guys said regarding that. So, yeah, there's a big, there's been a, here's the deal with muscle thickness measurements, which are measured by ultrasound. Um, they can't, it can't differentiate between, you know, true, let's say, increase in actual protein in the muscle and actually fluid and things like that. So, um, you know, you could go on a creatine loading thing or glycogen loading, something like that, and actually see an increase in muscle thickness just from the increase in water that's in the muscle. So, so there were some people that were arguing that um, that it's possible that um, the higher volume groups were just showing more muscle swelling, you know, um, because, you know, we, we, we measured 48 to 72 hours after the last training session um, there's some evidence in early on in a training program that 48 to 72 hours may not be enough, that, that there'll still be uh, muscle swelling. Um, but the problem is there's no research looking at people who have been on an eight or 10 week program to see if there's still, you know, a fair amount of, of swelling still, you know, within 48 hours after a training session. And on top of that, um, uh, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Are you saying about the, uh, 48 hours and 72 hours and how initially it's in the, uh, you do see at the start of a program, but maybe not so much towards the end of a program. Well, that's the thing. The thing is we don't know. I mean, um, the, the problem is, so people were linking to a bunch of studies showing that even in trained individuals, there's, there's at 48 hours after a training session. But the problem is these were still even though they were trained individuals, they weren't necessarily trained in the protocol that they were, they were actually using. So even trained individuals, for example, I put you on, you know, a, a protocol you're not used to, you're going to get muscle damage and swelling and stuff like that. So just because someone's trained, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, you've got to be trained at the um, protocol that you're using over a large number of weeks. And unfortunately there's, it just hasn't been looked at. Um, so, you know, can we rule out swelling or no? And here's another thing. It's also, you know, if it is due to swelling, that's also, um, you're assuming that more volume equals more swelling, right? Um, and, you know, that, I don't know of any evidence to necessarily indicate that's true, at least, you know, uh, at least more set, I should say more volume in terms of number of sets. Mm -hmm. um, there was one study that compared like high intensity to higher reps. So um, the, the higher reps group showed more swelling 
Um, but again, that was you know an acute study, um, and the subjects weren't accustomed to the protocol. Um, but it didn't really look at number of sets. Um, so basically, what you, you know, if you're going to try to argue it, argue it's due to swelling, you're assuming that you know within 48 hours, and that it's also impacted by volume. Um, and there's no evidence that that's true. There's no evidence that's false either. Uh, we just don't know. Sure. Um, so you know, we can we rule out swelling in this study? Can't totally rule it out. Um, I. I'm, I, I don't think it is swelling because basically our study was a replication of another study mm -hmm. um, that was done on military recruits. Um, and in that study, um, they measured up to five days after the last training session and they saw pretty much identical results to us. So, um, so I don't think that it's due to swelling, but you know, I can't, you know, we can't totally rule it out. You know, it it's, remains a possibility, you know. Sure. So. So uh, my favorite part about all this was that you ended up doing it yourself, right? I think you kind of wanted to test this out on yourself. Um, so can you kind of go into detail of, of what you did and the results you saw? Yeah. So I decided, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, try this myself. Um, I made a slight modification. I did, you know, like, tw you know, because, you know, I'm 45, my joints, you know, I was concerned about my joints. So I, I did 12 to 15 reps rather than 8 to 12 reps per set like we did in the study. Um, and I didn't do, you know, and I just focused on upper body, um, and I said, okay, I'm going to try this out, see if this is doable. So I did three days per week, 30 sets per muscle group, you know, which the mixture of compound and isolation movements, um, bit, you know, very similar structure to our study, you know, 90 second rest intervals, every set to failure, things like that. Um, and, uh, after was it two and a half to three months? I set I had set personal bests in a number of exercises, um, and I know I got at least a, a quarter of an inch in arm growth from it. Awesome. Um, and actually, since I've cut my training volume, that you know, some people have argued, well, that's probably just temporary. Well, it's still there. My my arms haven't shrunk, even though I've cut my volume back. So. Um, you know, because there were so many people that were, were saying that, oh, this is going to be overtraining and stuff like that. And I tried it, and it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it might be, you know. Yeah. It, like it, you know, now, I was smart about it. I built up to it. So I started off with one set per exercise. And as long as I wasn't getting, you know, if I wasn't sore the next day, I added another set. So then I went to two sets per exercise and then went to three sets per exercise um, and there were a few times where I got sore the next day. So I was like, okay, I'll stay at that volume until I no longer get sore. And usually it was just all I needed was an extra session or so at that volume. And then I would bump up. And so I slowly increased it till I hit five sets per exercise. And, uh, and even with only 48 eight hours of recovery between sessions and doing every set to failure, I was still, you know, my volume loads and my weights were going up. So, um, so I think it also lends idea that you can train your recovery ability if you work up to it. Like, you know, um, cause so many people would say, Oh, there's no way you could recover from that. You know, I was recovering just fine. Now a caveat to that is I was just, I, I was, uh, um, I was basically focused on maybe I was, uh, it was more of a specialization program. So I was basically focusing on arms and chest basically, mm. um, that were getting that level of volume, you know, back was only getting 15 sets per week. Um, and legs were only getting like six sets per week. So, so obviously I wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't do it for every muscle group. Um, but as, as a way of specialization, it worked really well. So, okay. Yeah. Well, th those are definitely good points to make because, um, if I imagine it for every muscle group, it does sound pretty intense, but like you said, you worked up, how long were you at the max volume? Maybe like half that time? Well, no, it was about two and a half months. I, it took me about a half month to maybe about two weeks to ramp up my volume. Oh, that's uh, bad. Because, you know, I was training three days per week, so right. um, maybe two, two and a half weeks. And then after that, you know, it was a good maybe 10 weeks straight of just training at the max volume. And so Awesome. Yeah, especially, I mean, once I read that every set was a failure, I think that's what got a lot of people too, including me. I mean, because we just don't think when you're doing that high of volume that you're, I mean, so this is like every set you couldn't have done a single more rep, right, with just yeah. more. So, I mean, that, just hearing that, that sounds pretty incredible to me, but it obviously worked. And even like you said, you're 45, so not that that's old, but probably impaired recovery compared to maybe somebody who's 25. 
Yeah. Um, well, and the thing is, is I mean, I should also use the caveat that half half of my movements were isolation movements. So, you know, if I was doing five exercises, only two of those were compound movements. So, mm. so the fact that I'm doing every set to failure is not nearly as big of a deal. It, it probably would have been a, a lot tougher if all my movements were compound lifts. So, um, you know, I mean, I was basically doing incline dumbbell press uh, uh, rows which are both compound movements, but then I was doing machine flies, uh, skull crushers, and bicep curls, which are all isolation movements. So right. um, doing all those sets to failure, really not that big of a deal, really. I mean, when you think yeah. about it, it's, 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 it's um, so. Were you counting those as a one-to-one -one ratio? So like incline bench press would also be like one for tricep and one for chest? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was doing, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So, um, there's something else I was going to ask about that. Uh, maybe I'll come back to it. <laughs> so um, something that I'd heard you talk about, I think, I don't remember what podcast I heard you talk about this, but it was like on testosterone. Um, and that's something I, I've gotten a lot of questions about recently is the influence of testosterone on muscle growth. And I, I think you summarize it pretty well. You have some stuff on your website about it too. Um, but people, they often think that it's like this huge deal because obviously, you know, that's the main uh, male hormone we think of, even though it is in females as well. Um, so one, I mean, why do you think it has this kind of like misconception around it that a slightly higher testosterone is going to give all these results? And two, what do we actually see in the real world? Yeah. I, so I think, I think people get it from anabolic steroids. They, they see steroid users, see all the muscle they get and they think, oh, well, you know, since steroids are derivatives of testosterone and, and also since men have more testosterone than women and men have more muscle, they think, oh, well, if you have more testosterone, you'll be able to, to gain more muscle. Um, the fact is, in real life, um, it's not, it's only maybe a little bit true, um, and, and really, what it comes down to is um, if you know if your testosterone levels are a little bit higher, um, you actually won't gain any muscle any faster in the gym, um, and that be. Um, but what it does impact is your what we call your base level of muscle. So just the the level of muscle you just carry around. Um, naturally, even without training. Um, and so people with higher testosterone levels, they'll have a little bit more of that baseline muscle. So like, you know, if your testosterone goes from, let's say, 400 to 600 nanograms per deciliter, um, you might carry just a little bit, maybe a couple more pounds or something like that, not a huge amount uh, of just baseline muscle. Um, but you aren't going to necessarily gain faster in the gym. Um, and so that's kind of really how testosterone works and it, and it explains why men have more muscle than women because uh, men actually don't gain muscle faster than women do in the gym in terms of relative gains you know if a man adds you know increases his muscle mass by 15 percent a woman will also increase her muscle mass by 15 percent but what happens is you know that's a relative gain on an absolute basis the man gain the man gains more because 15 um you know uh, fifteen percent of fifty is much more than fifteen percent of, let's say, thirty or twenty-five, which a woman might have. I'm just throwing, making up numbers sure. as I say yeah, this, yeah. just to illustrate what I'm talking about. But the relative gains are the same. So, um, so that's why you know people are too worried about what their testosterone levels are. Um, you know, there's really not a lot, a lot you can do naturally anyway with your testosterone, as long as you're getting enough sleep and making sure you're not carrying way too much body fat and also making sure you're not in too big of an energy deficit either. Um, you know, and make sure, you know, you're just not, you know, radically overtraining. Um, your testosterone levels will be fine, you know, um, and there's no way to bump them up. Uh, you know, there's no supplements or anything that you can take that'll, that'll change it. So, right. And, you know, some people will say, I think it's common to say that, well, as long as you're in the physiological range, it doesn't matter. And then once you get super physiological, it matters. But I would imagine, I mean, it, it sounds like from what you're saying, there are some differences even within the you know normal range. Because for me, it's at least kind of hard to think that if somebody's at 300 and somebody's at 900, there's going to be no difference. But then if somebody's at 900 versus 1800, there's going to be a difference. Like I imagine to some degree, it is a sliding scale. It's just that there are other very big factors involved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there is going to be a difference. Variations in the normal range um, will make a difference. It's just not as big of a difference as people think it's going to it's going to be. You know, 
Um, I don't even remember what I estimated it to be. It was something like maybe. Um, I think I remember seeing it was uh, about a kilogram per 100 nanograms per deciliter. Or I think like it was a half kilo, I think. Half per, kilo, per, okay. per 100 uh, point increase, yeah. So, um, so you know, someone, you know, uh, let's say comparing 900 to 300, um, you know, that's uh, what, six. So, so that's about three kilograms of of muscle, you know, um, so, um, you know, so, you know, around six, seven pounds, um, one might say, well, that's a lot. Uh, um, and, but the thing is, again, you're not going to be able to go from 300 to 900 naturally. I mean, you'd have to, right. Right. You'd have to add, you'd, you'd have to be on something to do that, but, uh, sure. And so I think, you know, you talked earlier about how we've seen that baseline muscle mass isn't necessarily predictive of how much you gain muscle. Um, and then we also kind of see that baseline testosterone isn't necessarily indicative of how much you gain muscle. I think it's very plausible that somebody with 300 nanograms per deciliter testosterone could get much bigger than somebody with 800 nanograms per deciliter if other genetic factors are in place to do well, so. Yeah, and that that's the case. I mean, you know... Um, there's uh, um, there's so many other factors, you know, genetic factors that are actually you know regulated at the muscle tissue itself that have nothing to do with hormones. You know, I mean, I mean, I look at somebody like you know um, Spencer Nadalski. You know, I think he told me that his testosterone has been around six. You know, he's a really muscular guy, right? Yeah. Um, you know, was a really great uh, wrestler in college. You know, things like that. Um, very muscular guy. Um, but his testosterone was like 600. So it's not like he has some huge, massive amount of testosterone in him. Right. Um, right. you know, I think Brett Contreras told me one time that his testosterone was in the 400s, you know, really? he's a, he's a huge jacked guy, you know, so, right, right. um, so there's way more to the equation than just testosterone. I mean, it, it plays a role, but, but it's, it's just not, not nearly as big of a role as people think. Yeah, I don't know if it was it was NFL or Olympic, some high level athletes. I remember they found that the average testosterone levels was only in like the four hundreds anyway. So Yeah, yeah. And I think I don't know if you've seen some of the newer research out there, but I think that they found that androgen receptor density is actually a much bigger factor than total testosterone levels. Have you seen that? I haven't seen that, but I mean it would make sense, you know. So mm -hmm. Yep. So um one other thing that people think about a lot with um with muscle growth. And I, I know there was at least one study showing that insulin had a bigger effect on muscle growth, at least in the, this acute study um, than testosterone. So at the same time, you know, we're seeing people now, keto is becoming this huge thing again. Um, even the carnivore diet is being brought up. So can you give a little bit into the role of insulin in muscle growth? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Here's the deal with insulin. I mean, you know, people like to say insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's not really an anabolic hormone. It's more, one might car argue, an anti-catabolic hormone. So, mm -hmm. um, so insulin is much better at basically like slowing down the release of free of amino acids from muscle tissue. Um, but it's not really. It doesn't. It, it's it's fairly passive role. It's not really. It doesn't play a huge role in you know shuttling amino acids into muscle and things like that. Um, you know, muscles can take up amino acids just fine. And, and we know that from, there's a number of studies that have compared, let's say, post-workout protein feeding to post-workout protein plus carb feeding. And adding the carbs doesn't increase the amount of muscle you gain, even though the insulin levels will be much higher. So, um, so insulin doesn't play like that really strong of a, you know, role in muscle growth. And so there's, you know, this idea, you, you don't really need to manipulate your insulin levels or something to try to maximize growth, so. Do you think people who are on a very low carbohydrate diet then can just as effectively build muscle or do you think there's any limitations there? Um, I think there might be limitations, but I don't think it has anything to do with insulin. Um, okay. I think it may more have to do um, with uh, like um, training intensity and things like that. Um, there's been some research, it's not very strong, that has suggested that more moderate carb intakes might be a little bit better for weight training performance than low carb intakes. And so over the long run, you know, your ability to push yourself and things like that, because like or not, you know, weight training is a very, is, is purely a glycolytic activity. So 
if you're on a low carb diet, you're not, you're not providing your muscles with a lot of that fuel that, um, that you would need. And, and that would be especially the case if you were training with a lot with, you know, a fairly amount of, a fair amount of volume. So. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, with these, uh, podcasts that I'm doing, I like to kind of give people actionable steps. So, you know, we talked a lot about volume just now and, and that study that you uh, helped with, if somebody is looking to try an experiment similar to like you did, um, one of the questions that I was thinking earlier was, did you keep the exercises the same for each of those three sessions or did you switch it up each one? No, I kept them exactly the same every single session. So wow. three days a week, same exercises. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to maximize the repeated bout effect, which means basically um, I wanted to, if I could, eliminate any muscle damage, you know, because um, the less frequently you do an exercise, the more likely you're going to get some muscle damage from it. Um, and there's more and more evidence indicating now that muscle damage is not, I wouldn't say counterproductive to growth, but it at least doesn't, it certainly doesn't seem to help with muscle, with growth at all. Um, and we know, and the thing is, I wanted any protein synthesis that I stimulated in a training session, I wanted to make sure it was going towards muscle growth and not to repair muscle damage. So that's why I kept the, the, uh, the same exercises all the time. Um, because I knew I'd had that repeated bout effect and my muscles would be very resistant to any damage. Cause you know, when you, when you start getting a, at a, any frequency of less than two days per week for any exercise, mm -hmm. then you're not getting as much of that repeated bout effect and you're going to tend to see more damage from, uh, from doing a particular exercise. So, yeah, I knew the, uh, the evidence was kind of more and more in favor of like the, uh, the tension on the muscle and not so much muscle damage. Um, I didn't know if it was like really conclusive at this point. So I know, I don't know if you've really done anything with like the blood flow restriction training and things like that. I know a lot of people speculated that that was purely a uh, metabolite, you know, um, the metabolite training, I guess, is what caused the muscle growth. Are you thinking that that's kind of going to fade out at this point or you still see benefits to it? Um, well, for the BFR, um, I would, I'm still in favor. I think the evidence indicates that, um, the BFR works through more muscle fiber recruitment and not through the metabolites itself. So basically mm -hmm. is you can almost see it. You're just basically pre fatiguing a muscle to, to maximize muscle uh, fiber recruitment at a much lower load, basically. Um, and we know that like if you compare BFR training to light load training, that's done to failure. There's usually no difference in uh, muscle growth between the two conditions. So, so whether you do 20 reps to failure, or you do BFR and you just do 10 reps, um, the end result is the same. Um, it's just what the BFR does is it, it stimulates those high threshold motor units to recruit at, you know, much earlier. You don't have to, because it creates that fatigue, you know, very quickly. So, right. I think this is probably over a year ago now, but I remember Lane Norton because he, he was a fan of it for people who maybe had gone through an injury or something like that. He had talked about a study going on where, they were going to match like uh, standard weightlifting with weightlifting plus the blood flow restriction. Because as far as I've seen, I've just seen the comparison of one versus the other. Um, have you seen any data yet showing the, them combined and if that gave an advantage? No, I haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, I'm surprised it hasn't been done yet because I know a lot of people have wondered about it. Um, I know anecdotally people have claimed that it's, it still seems to benefit when they add it on top, but I haven't actually seen any research on it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Okay. So, um, so for people who you know want to try out this higher volume experiment, uh, I guess you kind of already gave the answer there. Just start with one or maybe two sets per muscle group, and then just kind of ramp up. Is there anything else you'd give as advice for people trying it out? No, I, I would just say um, stick with exercises that are fairly joint friendly. You know, um, especially if you're going to do it with a high frequency. Um, you know, like that's the other thing I did. I like. You know, all my movements were, you know, I wasn't doing any barbell bench press or anything that mm. might be hard on my shoulder or anything like that. So, um, um, but, but I think if you do that and you ramp it up, just try it out and see what happens, you know. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> um, more people again, try Like it. I said, it's, it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it might be. It actually ended up working out fairly well, so. Yeah, especially when I think of the same exercises, my, my joints hurt thinking about it, but you know, I'll probably give it a shot. Um, hopefully more people give it a shot and maybe we can get some more anecdotes about it too. And that's the other thing. I also remember, you know, I was also in the 12 to 15 rep range, which is mm -hmm. even a little bit easier on your joints than eight to 12. You know, it's like, 
Um, so that was probably part of it too, you know. So because um, um, there's no there, there's no muscle building benefit of doing eight to twelve versus twelve to fifteen. It's just, I mean, I would much prefer eight to twelve. All right. Yeah. Um, but but I'm at a point now where my joints just feel way better at twelve to fifteen. So um, uh, so yeah. Awesome. All right, James. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, people can find you on weightology.net. Um, where else can people find your work? Um, yeah, well, uh, actually, just go to my website, weightology.net. Like, everything's on there, all my research publications, um, my research review, uh, all my social media accounts that people can follow. Everything's, cool. everything's all in one place there. So, Great. Well, thanks again for talking today. Yeah, thanks for having me.